Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video we are going to be updating our endocrine system video. So this video is going to be replacing my much older endocrine video introduction video and so I suggest you watch this one instead. And we are going to now unpack the differences between endo and exocrine glands. We're going to look at the hormones that are secreted and their functions. And finally, we're going to tackle the most difficult aspect of this section, which is going to be the negative feedback loop that we see in exam questions. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And to make your life incredibly easy, grade 12s, I have the cheat sheet study guide available on my website, which has all of this information in beautiful diagrams, simple to understand, and it makes studying so much easier. So let's dive in to some critical understanding in the difference between an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. First of all, Exocrine glands are glands that are going to produce a substance that is going to leave the gland and it is generally going to leave via a duct. And a duct, if we're not so sure, is basically like a tube or a tunnel and it is going to go down through that duct and it is going to either go on, for example, to the surface of your skin, like this would be a sweat gland and we're going through the duct to the surface of the skin. Or it could be, for example, the pancreas. The pancreas has ducts, which allows pancreatic juice to go into your small intestine. So it's like a substance leaving the gland and, and exiting. So you can actually like physically see the substance. On the other hand, endocrine glands, well, they are ductless. And in actual fact, they transport all of their hormones and their substances through your bloodstream. And that's another difference between the two. Endocrine glands are generally going to be making hormones and they are going to leave via your blood. Whereas exocrine glands are generally going to create secretions. And those secretions are going to leave via a duct and move into another organ. Like, for example, secretions would be, you know, earwax or your saliva. Now that we've looked at the differences between the two glands, we're going to focus solely on endocrine glands and their hormones, where they're produced and which ones do we need to know for the exam. So now let's look into our endocrine glands and the hormones that they produce, starting off with the hypothalamus in the brain, which produces ADH, also known as antidiuretic hormone. Now, I know some of you might go, but wait, in grade 11, we learned that that was made in the pituitary gland. I need you to understand that sometimes that is taught that way, and in the moment in grade 11, that's correct. But now that we've progressed into grade 12, we actually need to expand our knowledge and actually know that the hypothalamus makes ADH and it, it secretes it into the pituitary gland and then the pituitary gland does the kind of secondary distribution. So that's not where it's made. I want you to rather think of it as like the pituitary gland holds on to it until we need it. But for our exams, most importantly, ADH is made in the hypothalamus. Now we move on to the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is also known as the hypophysis. Um, I would like everybody to know both of the names because some examiners like to ask either name. So let's know both of them. And the pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus and it secretes many, many useful hormones. To list some of them, we have thyroid stimulating hormone, we have follicle stimulating hormone, we have luteinizing hormone, we have um, growth hormone, and we have prolactin which is the hormone that we use to create breast milk. So those are the main categories that we see there. And I want you to notice something about all these hormones. These are all stimulating hormones. Generally, these sets of hormones are going to stimulate other structures to make other hormones. The next um, endocrine gland is the thyroid hormone, and that is going to produce thyroid 
Roxin. And thyroxin is there for our metabolism and it speeds it up or slows it down. Then we have the pancreas, and the pancreas is both an endo and exocrine gland. However, we're only going to focus on its endocrine function, and that is where we secrete insulin and we secrete glucagon, which remember, they are there to regulate the amount of sugar in your bloodstream. Moving on to our adrenal glands. Our adrenal glands are not just responsible for um, adrenaline, which is the first one that we need to know. Remember, that is the hormone that is going to speed up your heart rate. But we also need to know that the hormone aldosterone, which is the hormone responsible for regulating salt, comes from this region. And just as an extra piece of information, there is a very important relationship between aldosterone and ADH that we're not going to cover in this video, but I do cover it in my salt and water homeostasis video, which I have linked above now for you if you need any clarity on that in future. Then moving on to our ovaries and testes. Our ovaries are going to secrete estrogen. And, of course, progesterone. And then in our testes, we are going to produce testosterone. Now, um, I also want to include the placenta here because a lot of us overlook the placenta when we study. And I would like you to know that the placenta also produces progesterone and it takes over the job of um, secreting progesterone from the ovaries once the placenta is formed that's what takes over from the corpus luteum secreting it now in grade 12 we do not need to know what the thymus or the pineal gland is so we're going to leave that out of our lesson today now let's get into the more difficult and often what i find a lot of students struggle with is what is feedback but we need to start off with what positive feedback is. And we very rarely learn about positive feedback. And I think it's quite useful to help you know the difference. Because I think, I think many students think positive means good and negative means bad. No, no, no. It simply means what is the reaction and what follows that reaction. Is it a positive response? So do we add more? Or is it a negative response? Do we take away? So positive feedback works like this. I want you to imagine that there is a herd of cattle and all of a sudden the cattle start running. The more they run, the more the panic level of the other cattle increases, which causes more cattle to run. And as more cattle run, more of those non-runners panic and they start running. Do you see what's happening here? This is positive feedback. You're constantly adding and adding and adding and you don't take away. Now there are hormones that follow the system where you add hormone and you add and you add and you don't take away. But we are not going to learn any of those hormones while we are in high school. This is just to explain the difference. Instead, we are going to focus all of our attention on negative feedback. Negative feedback is when you are taking something away. In other words, you're changing something so that you can go back to the norm. And I love this little diagram because it simplifies it so perfectly. The little individual in the middle is at its norm. And in this case, it's talking about body temperature. Now, this is how negative feedback is going to work. If we start off with, on the left-hand side, our body temperature decreases, so we get cold, right? You have mechanisms in your body that are going to fix that. Now, that would be a homeostasis lesson, right? That would be vasoconstriction and vasodilation, and I have linked that video above now if you want to learn about that, and you'll need to know it. And what happens is those mechanisms increase your body temperature back to the norm. On the other side, however, if your body gets too hot, your body is now going to use cooling mechanisms like sweating, and that's going to decrease your body temperature and bring it back to the norm. So this is the key takeaway from this section. Negative feedback is when a system responds to an outside stimulus that's changing the environment and does something to bring it back to normal again. In this instance, we were either shivering to bring it back to normal and warmth, or we were sweating to cool down. 
If you compare it to our cattle example, because that was positive feedback, in order to help those cattle, what we would need to do is introduce negative feedback. And we could introduce perhaps um, a herdsman and he could calm the cattle down, bringing them back to norm so they don't continue to over panic the rest of the herd and just have a loop of endless panic. Do you see how negative feedback is assisting? And in some cases it reduces like we want to reduce the body temperature, and in other cases it increases, like when we want to increase the body temperature. Now, as always, I like to finish off my videos with a terminology recap, and remember, you can use these to make your own flashcards, or you could even get my own already made flashcards. They are on my website. There's plenty of free versions, but there's also a complete entire full set that you can purchase as well. It has every single thing you need to know for grade 12 life sciences. So let's get into the recap. First things first, let's talk about the exocrine and endocrine glands. Exocrine are glands, remember, that secrete into a duct um, and they create secretions, whereas endocrines are going to create um, ductless secretions that are going to go straight into the bloodstream, generally hormones. And then we looked at all of the um, glands that we need to know. The hypothalamus making ADH, the pituitary gland, the master gland making many, many, many hormones like FSH, LH, um, growth hormone, etc. Thyroid is where we make thyroxin for our metabolism. The adrenal gland makes adrenaline and aldosterone. Remember, aldosterone is for salt. Then we had the pancreas, which did insulin and glucagon, which regulates our sugar. Ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone. Testes do testosterone. The placenta does um, our progesterone, which remember takes over from the ovaries later on in pregnancy. And finally, we finished our video looking at negative and positive feedback. Remember, positive feedback is when an action occurs and you continue to add, and that adding creates more, and so you add more and that creates more, versus negative feedback, where you are starting at a set point, a norm, and something around you is changing, and you need to change yourself or you need to change your environment to bring you back to the norm as we did with the temperature. You could be adding something in negative feedback, but you could also be taking something away. The key bit is negative feedback is linked to the norm. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.